President Ronald Reagan's Sermon on Communism. During my first press conference as president, in answer to a direct question, I pointed out that, as good Marxist-Leninists, the Soviet leaders have openly and publicly declared that the only morality they recognize is that which will further their cause, which is world revolution. I should point out, I was only quoting Lenin, their guiding spirit, who said in 1920 that they repudiate all morality that proceeds from supernatural ideas or ideas that are outside class conceptions. Morality is entirely subordinate to the interests of class war, and everything is moral that is necessary for the annihilation of the old exploiting social order and for uniting the proletariat. I think the refusal of many influential people to accept this elementary fact of Soviet doctrine illustrates a historical reluctance to see totalitarian powers for what they are. We saw this phenomenon in the 1930s. We see it too often today. This does not mean we should isolate ourselves and refuse to seek an understanding with them. Let us pray for the salvation of all those who live in totalitarian darkness. Pray they will discover the joy of knowing God. But until they do, let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man, and predict its eventual domination of all peoples of the earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. It was C.S. Lewis who, in his unforgettable Screwtape Letters, wrote, The greatest evil is not now done in these sordid dens of crime that Dickens loved to paint. It is not done even in concentration camps and labor camps. In those we see its final result, but it is conceived and ordered, moved, seconded, carried, and minuted, in clear, carpeted, warmed, and well-lighted offices, by quiet men with white collars and cut fingernails and smooth, shaven cheeks who do not need to raise their voice. Because these quiet men do not raise their voices, because they sometimes speak in soothing tones of brotherhood and peace, because... Like other dictators before them, they are always making their final territorial demand. Some would have us accept them at their word and accommodate ourselves to their aggressive impulses. But if history teaches anything, it teaches simple-minded appeasement or wishful thinking about our adversaries is folly. It means the betrayal of our past, the squandering of our freedom. So I urge you to speak out against those who would place the United States in a position of military and moral inferiority. You know, I have always believed that old screw tape preserves his best efforts for those of you in the church. So in your discussions of the nuclear freeze proposals, I urge you to beware the temptation of pride, the temptation blithely to declare yourselves above it all and label both sides equally at fault, to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong, good and evil. I ask you to resist the attempts of those who would have you withhold your support for this administration's efforts to keep America strong and free, while we negotiate real and verifiable reductions in the world's nuclear arsenals and one day, with God's help, their total elimination. While America's military strength is important, let me add here that I have always maintained that the struggle now going on for the world will never be decided by bombs or rockets by armies or military might. The real crisis we face today is a spiritual one. At root, it is a test of moral will and faith. Whitaker Chambers, the man whose own religious conversion made him a witness to one of the most terrible traumas of our age, the Hiss Chambers case, wrote that the crisis of the Western world exists to the degree in which the West is indifferent to God, the degree to which it collaborates in communism's attempt to make man stand alone without God. For Marxism, Leninism is actually the second oldest faith, he said, first proclaimed in the Garden of Eden with the words of temptation, ye shall be as gods. The Western world can answer this challenge, he wrote, but only provided that its faith in God and the freedom he enjoins is as great as communism's faith in man. I believe we shall rise to the challenge. I believe that communism is another sad, bizarre chapter in human history whose last pages even now are being written. I believe this because the source of our strength in the quest for human freedom is not material but spiritual, and because it knows no limitation, it must terrify and ultimately triumph over those who would enslave their fellow man. For, in the words of Isaiah, he giveth power to the faint, 
and to them that have no might he increased strength. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary.